This is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Kelly, for the long introduction. And uh, thank you, Shipping, for uh, hosting me today. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, today, I will talk about last four to five years of my research in blueberries, not mine, our, our research in blueberries. Blueberries are one of the fewer crops that have been domesticated in uh, North America. And they are perennial shrubs. The current economic value of blueberries is around $1 billion. Uh, blueberries have a um, high amount of compound, phyto compounds like anthocyanin, phenolic acids, and flavonoids, and so on. So, health benefiting compounds, along with uh, vitamins and many trace elements. Um, many research studies uh, show that regular consumption of blueberries helps. Um, reducing the wear and tear of age-related issues. Uh, because of this increased awareness of blueberries, there is an increasing demand. Uh, uh, demand also is increasing for the last two decades. So you can see here, there is a continuous demand for blueberries uh, consumption. The green line is the consumption uh, has been increasing uh, uh, from 2000 onwards, even though production also has been increased to meet the demand, we can still, we are still importing a, a large portion of blueberries from other countries. So that leaves us uh, scope for further expansion of blueberries, also uh, crop improvement. I just wanted to give you a brief introduction here about. Um, here, I just wanted to show you a brief introduction of uh, different uh, blueberry species. Okay. And like uh, slightly about taxonomy. Uh, blueberries fall under the family Ericaceae. And the next hierarchy uh, in this one is the genus Vaccinium. Under the genus, there are more than 200 to 400 uh, species are there. But they typically, what we call them as the blueberries are uh, from the section Cynococcus. It may be around 200 species around. The high bush, there are few terminology. I don't want to take up too much time, but it's important to give you some introduction. Uh, the cultivated blueberries are called high bush blueberries. Basically, we are the large, they are larger plants, easy to cultivate. And um, um, for horticulture and maintenance, it's easier and, and bigger fruits also. The low bush blueberries are from Vaccinium augustifolium. What we, you see in the frozen section in the grocery stores and also what blueberries that you see in the processing stores are all from the low bush blueberries. What you see on the fresh market, the fresh blueberries that we get, those are high bush blueberries. High bush blueberries are typically grown in Canada and northern parts of the United States. So many of the cultivated blueberries are tetraploid. However, uh, cultivated blueberries are foreign bosom. They're mostly what we see in the varieties that are tetraploid. However, uh, we also have diploid and exoploid. The low bush blueberries mostly are tetraploid. What we call a southern species are uh, uh, Darovai, Vergatum, and Tenellum. They are mostly low bush and grown in southern uh, subtropical regions of the United States. So, low bush, we are considering this, I'm talking about the higher, uh, high temperature stress tolerance. So, they may have some genes that can contribute uh, to the high temperature. Uh, tolerance. Also, like a, 
originally uh, blueberries were grown in northeastern parts of the US and Canada, but however, now we are growing them um, in Canas and Florida and so on. So places, uh, and also in uh, South America, because we have developed um, southern high bush types also. So southern high bush types we develop by intercrossing the northern high bush with southern species. So blueberries, I was talking to I think, uh, shipping in the morning, how the blueberries are uh, acid-loving acid plants, how you can grow. So they are very finicky plants to grow. And the best ideal temperature is in between four and five soil pH temperature. There are also shallow uh, root system. So uh, since they have a shallow root system and also likes moist soil, we have to have a well-moist soil, but good drainage also. So if you have a stagnant water, uh, they cannot survive. So those are a few tips to grow blueberries. And they also have a long juvenile period compared to many other uh, plants. So you, know, you can able to see fruits and flowers after two to three years of cuttings. And uh, or, uh, if it is coming from the seeds, minimum three years. But you can see a good fruit uh, yield once they attain eight to 10 years of age. So why, what is the need for um, improvement of uh, blueberries? We're already growing everywhere, and uh, what is the need? But since the blueberries are a relatively new crop, I say that because we domesticated only a century ago, around 1920s and that time. So from that time only we started applying our selection process. Um, so there is a uh, there is a scope for a lot of improvement. And also last 20 years, we can see expansion of our crop uh, geographically, as well as uh, the consumption. Of course, if we think about any uh, crop improvement, we first think about higher yields, right? So we want the farmers to be profitable. And then uh, fruit improvement, uh, fruit quality. So fruit quality here, we talk in a different languages here. So when we talk about fresh market, we wanted to have a sweeter food, um, the good appealing one. Also, we should be able to mechanic, um, um, handle very well to, for transportation, so and so qualities. But if we are talking about um, ocean spray or other juice uh, making companies, they would like to have um, more acidic and within the acid balance uh, juice because we don't want to have add, we don't want to add too many additives now in our juice products or any products. So they would like to see a different ratios of acid profile in the fruit. And as a consumer for fresh market, we wanted to have a sweet fruit and appealing one. And the major, uh, and in addition to that, the major uh, input cost for growing blueberries is uh, harvesting, right? So for fresh market, we still, in majority of the cases, we are harvesting by hand. That is the highly, um, one of the costliest input that we are investing. The, so far, what we selected, blueberries are for um, looking at the yield, um, taste, so and so qualities, not meant for, um, using uh, machines to harvest. So there is a room for improving plant architecture that can allow uh, easy, uh, easy harvesting with machines. So which can include the inflorescence. Now, uh, if you have a close compact inflorescence, uh, it's, it will not be a possible. You may, have, you may lose a lot of green fruits. And also if you, the whole inflorescence are, are ripening at different stages, also, you will not be getting as much yield as possible. So we would like to see some open inflorescence where, um, and also the, all the fruits can mature, at least majority of the fruits can mature or ripen at the similar time. So that would be an ideal uh, architecture of the blueberries for mechanical harvesting. And when you have intense cropping for any crops, you will have pests and diseases. So naturally, we have a room for improvement over there. 
and my interest last four five years is to look at the uh, high temperature stress tolerance. And there have been a lot of studies done for freeze tolerance. I know these are two contrasting uh, things, but there is a, another no, another day of talk for freeze tolerance. But for today, I'll focus on high temperature stress. <clears throat> So remember one thing uh, is that um, the northern high bush blueberries are um, originated in the, uh, in the temperate regions, but now we are cultivating in beyond the, their um, natural habitat. So California, many places, almost 40 states in the US, as well many states. And uh, here, uh, just to prove, uh, not to prove that uh, in addition to that, we can see in this uh, graph, um, the number of heat waves uh, per, per year was over in an average two heat waves per year in 60s, but now it's almost six uh, average six heat waves per year that we have been looking at. And also the length of the, the heat wave season is, it was almost 20 days per year, it used to be, but in the 60s, and now it is almost 70 days, more than two months. This two months coincides with where the fruit um, uh, flowering and fruit development is happening. It's very <coughs> crucial for northern bush blueberries to have some innate resistance to the high temperature tolerance. So here, uh, it's, uh, what happens when, so also we see in, in, even in la, this summer, we saw in the places where we never had like 45 degrees uh, temperature in um, Northern Europe and many places here as well. So what happens when you have 35 and above degrees for a couple of days or three days, um, the, the fruits, wherever the sun exposure happens will become softened and then shrivel. And then when as other into the, the physiological maturity happens, they become like um, uh, dry fruits Necro because of necrosis. And the typical symptom that you see on the leaves are scorching. So this also has been published in one of the papers, not from our lab, but in a, it's a um, background information for this study. We were looking at whether when we thought about high temperature, because not much research has been done in this um, um, high, high temperature stress area for blueberries. So we were looking whether um, the existing varieties exhibit any variation for this trait. So in this uh, study, they um, they saw they had they tested on um, four different varieties, and also looked at the electrolyte leakage and the, temp uh, and the MDA accumulation. So here you can see the susceptible variety, Brigetta, uh, has a higher amount of uh, electrolyte leakage when temperatures hit 40 degrees. The same way, higher levels of MDA in Brigetta, susceptible one, uh, with the higher MDA levels at 40 degrees. But until 30 degrees centigrade, you don't see a big difference, the significant difference. Same way here um, for other uh, photosynthesis and fluorescence uh, parameters, you can see the difference among the genotypes when the temperature reaches 40 degrees. Now in the summer also, we saw 43 degrees in France for three days or four days. So those are the times um, critical for blueberry and also it coincides with the fruit development. So this is the seedling or a, uh, seedling tolerance. So short blue uh, has a fewer um, plants we lost, but in the Brigetta, almost 43% of the plants was gone with high temperature stress. So with this background, we thought maybe we can um, look for candidate genes um, from the genotypes that we have, uh, or we can um, make new classes and then uh, see 
alleles are genes that can help with the here temperature with tolerance. So we decided we will go with the um, deployed species. So that way it's easier for us to do the genomic analysis. And also when we started, we didn't have um, a reference genome of our blueberries. So we thought with the best strategy to use a deployed genome, uh, deployed species. So foreign bosom uh, is one of the parents and the Doraway is one of the parents in our process. Uh, Darawa is from southern, uh, collected in Florida, um, southern state, and um, foreign bosom is from New Jersey area, local, uh, local collected from those species. And you can also see the difference in the leaf uh, morphology. So the foreign bosom is a deciduous plant, it sheds leaves in the winter time. Darawa has a waxy coating, and the leaf orientation is different that can help withstand with high temperatures. So in the back side, you can hear me, right? In the back. Yes. So one of my graduate uh, student, previous grad student, and she uh, looked at it. Is there any uh, diff, um, physiological anatomical differences are there between these two parents before we uh, initiate the studies? So she uh, imposed a uh, 40 degrees, uh, like um, mimicking the daytime temperature until 40 degrees and then collected leaf samples at the same, zero, six hours and nine hours, and then looked at the scanning my electron microscopy. So what you see and the red dots, why he is a chlorophyll, the structure of the chlorophyll, and the gray color is the stomata. And that way, the uh, intensity that you see, red uh, intensity, uh, that is a uh, chlorophyll structure. So at 40 degrees, zero hours, six hours, and nine hours, so we can assume, or I can see that the chlorophyll uh, is almost intact. So intact, how I can say that you can see high intensity uh, red uh, structures here. Whereas in a uh, foreign bosom, you can see small, small, tiny dots everywhere. So what happened there, at least our theory is what happened the chloroplast might have burst open and the thylakoids and stoma, uh, they just popped up. So what, how I explain that is that chlorophyll is packed tightly like a small purse with stacks of coins. And if you have a high pressure with the high temperature because of the cellular damage is happening. So the thylakoids may still spill open like how the coins spill open. So you don't have the tight purse anymore. So that's how you have smaller dots of tiny dots um, uh, you can see on the scanning electron microscopy and the carim bosom. Whereas in Darovai from the southern species, you can see it is almost intact chloroplast. In, uh, I also looked at the stomata, a stomatal opening. Uh, in the carim bosom, you can see there's almost a similar opening uh, as we progress with the temperature. But here in Darovai, as um, we go out by nine, of, nine hours or six hours, you, you can start the shrink, closing up, slightly closing up the stomata. There's the indicator of um, tolerance for the high temperature, high temperature stress. I think this, these are a good candidates for uh, uh, studying further. And we took a GWAS and a gene expression studies to find genes. So within five years, I, it's impossible for me to establish a crossings and a, a study. So I collaborated with uh, Dr. Nick Wurza from Rutgers. Um, he's uh, retired now, but he was gracious enough to share is um, research experiments and share his germplasm and uh, the population with me for my studies. So OPB, what you see here, the parent OPB, uh, different clones, 15 and 88 are different clones of OPB, is foreign body. And then different clones of uh, Darovai. So we made two sets of crosses. Since the, also I wanted to warn you here that uh, these parents are not homozygous, like what you see having um, rice and other um, soybean. 
So you have a homozygous uh, parents, but these are already heterozygous. So um, to start with, and then F ones. Uh, we cannot self them because they have a highly cross they are highly cross pollinated species uh, highly self um, self incompatibility is there so you have to cross them to get the uh, seed so we develop a uh, uh, pseudo f2 population we had around almost 1000 um, f2 pseudo f2 population but we have for this uh, jivas we utilized around 260 to 300 uh, plants So here are the F2 that we um, set up the experiment with 40 degrees on one. Krishna did it. Um, he is the main person working on this project, another postdoc in the lab. So here itself, you can see in the visually, there are, it's not the shade. So there are some plants um, with good tolerance, and there are, you can see this spotting symptoms in between the F2. And then here is the one uh, with Dr. Ota and his group with us, with him, we do fruit acids and uh, phenotyping fruit acids and sugar. So here is another one. So for Jeeva's uh, phenotyping, uh, we took both sides. One way, what are the, the first responses will happen in the plant, the damage, plant damage when exposed to the temperature. The other way and other side, we also measured few things, um, few parameters that inherently what defense mechanism plants can exhibit. So as a biomarker. So Krishna, uh, Dr. Krishna, he's uh, from our lab. He's measuring um, different chlorophyll and the fluorescence uh, parameters with polyfin and chlorophyll for phenotyping. So what you see after four days of exposure to 40 degrees, what you see here, some of the plants, uh, like the tolerant plants that you see on the top row, uh, you don't see any scorching. However, um, in the bottom row, you can see the scorching effect. The, sorry, these are the sensitive plants and the top row can be resistant plants. They have to. And then once we have collected data, we look at the frequency distribution, how they look in the population. So you can see normal distribution for majority of the parameters that we took. And for the quantum yield, you can have the frequency distribution also looked at the um, box plots to see the range of uh, range for, uh, for this population. Uh, it's uh, pretty decent for a uh, goal with the GWAS. And again, um, box plots for other parameters. Uh, we also looked at the heritability uh, because this is our first time we are working with this crop and these uh, uh, parameters, whether they are uh, heritable, if we select for any of those traits. Uh, since uh, we have a decent heritability, so we still hope for, uh, we, we, we're going to have a hope for better improvement of these traits. And this is the regular protocol. Uh, with the Illumina sequencing and uh, um, we are with similar um, protocol, we also have a paper published for a different uh, uh, project. So from this uh, sequencing for this population of 260, uh, we had around a billion reads, raw reads, and then um, map those reads it's with the uh, draper text, uh, uh, draper tetraploid genome. So we were able to get the reference genome by that time. We had 85%, uh, almost 85% of mapping. And after filtration, uh, you have uh, 126,000 uh, SNPs identified from this uh, sequencing. When we look at the Manhattan plots, for each of the traits that uh, we have seen. Uh, there are around 1,323 SNPs that are associated with these traits that we measured. And from here, uh, what we did, we selected um, SNPs that have more than, that are associated with more, more than one trait to go forward uh, to make it easier. 
So with that, we have around uh, 245 SNPs uh, that have been associated with more than uh, one trait and uh, that we measured. And uh, out of this, 172 of them in the genic regions of the uh, genic regions of the genome. Um, almost 40 genes are um, in the chromosome one and um, 11 and 12 also have a considerable genes uh, from the that are associated with multiple tra traits and multiple parameters for the um, heat tolerance. So these are some of the candidate genes from those uh, what we selected from the uh, GWAS. At the same time, uh, simultaneously, I had uh, we had another uh, uh, student. Uh, grad student who was uh, working on uh, gene expression studies. So we use the same parents uh, from Karim Bojum and uh, Adaroway for gene expression studies. So she um, treated plants with uh, 45 degrees of nine hours, six hours and nine hours collected samples. So we, do, we took this um, name. She also did preliminary uh, um, experiment with uh, cultivars that the cultivars that we have using uh, northern high bush, southern high bush and rabbit eye, different genotypes. So based on the preliminary study, we uh, chose these time points for uh, this project. So for a, for a gene, gene analysis, gene expression analysis. So these are typical um, sequencing protocols that she follows. And after, um, <coughs> assembly and uh, filtration with the quality checks. We have around uh, 99,000 assembled genes in a quorum bosom and uh, almost similar amount, uh, 109,000 genes in that way. So move forward. So, so these are when the Venn diagram of the up, down regulate, up regulated genes and then uh, down regulated genes. Then we also looked at the common genes along um, across the genotypes and across the treatment. So what we were interested uh, to go to the, to pick a candidate genes by the common genes. And we took these 325 common genes and cross compared with the GWAS genes. Um, is there any, um, because we, if, Typically, they are responding. We should be able to see here also, right? From what we found from GWAS that are associated. So we have around 30 genes that are common uh, in both the studies. So that is a good sign. So this can be a strong candidates, candidate genes for either um, marker development or um, to for further studies as well. So from this uh, two studies, we were able to identify 245 uh, candidate genes. And also so both susceptible and tolerant F2 plants. So if, since these are uh, de uh, diploids, we can transfer the traits that we identified from here using classes with the tetraploid blueberries. So that uh, project is underway now. Um, we are also developing uh, PCR markers because every time you cannot use the SNP markers. So at least with the facilities that we have, so we are converting them into PCR markers and um, making them into robust um, everyday usable markers so to help aid in the selection process. So that's the one, another project also, I wanted to share it quickly because it just published yesterday. Uh, it's not for promotion or anything, but I just wanted to share it with <laughs> you. Uh, so I was talking about the second, in my second or third slide, there are 200 species of uh, blueberries. So we wanted to see, if it's, uh, we are, um, the reason also there is a, a, another study from, I don't remember, there is a Florida group or Carolina's group. Um, even though we have several um, varieties of blueberries uh, releasing now, so for uh, to southern to grow them in the south or in, uh, in 
are in the tropical temperate region, but most of them, the base genetic material is coming from the only fewer, fewer plants, fewer beings. But most of the southern species have come, like Florida four or few other, few other uh, plants are more few other cultivars. So exploring more uh, wild species, there are plenty of wild species, and we uh, we have availability uh, in different uh, from different groups also. Exploring them, characterizing them will be beneficial for further breeding improvement program. But with that goal, uh, we looked. Uh, one of my uh, master's students was actually who is now who is uh, who is doing PhD in Florida. Um, he uh, took uh, he looked uh, down, developed identified SNPs with the uh, genotyping by sequencing method, and then compared the genetic relations. I am showing. I am really interested in this project. Uh, with, we found really good uh, stuff. So, just to give you a brief idea, here um, one of the boreal um, vaccinium boreal collected in uh, Canada, Nova Scotia regions. We have uh, Rocky Mountains, um, Alpine region habitat. And the corymbosome is collected from New Jersey, where you have swamp, uh, swampy areas that mostly grow under high areas around the rivers and creeks. And then 10 LM uh, is from Virginia and North Carolina regions. And uh, Darway and um, Mercinitis, they were collected in uh, Florida and Alabama regions. So different places uh, were collected by. Uh, uh, Dr. Nick Watch and his group in the 80s or some time ago. So I started using those genotypes because they were just growing them and I wanted to explore more uh, with those to see which they can be beneficial. So in total, we have, we utilized, uh, sorry, we used uh, 195 accessions from each species. So I think somewhere you have those numbers also. So from those, after the quality control and everything, you have 60,000 SNPs that can be utilized for uh, further analysis. So when we do the PCA, you have a clear cut a separation of southern types. All these are southern types, and these two are northern type uh, <coughs> blueberries. But within the northern type, boreal is here, it's separated out from corymbosum. But whereas in the southern types, all of them at least uh, um, in, in um, they didn't separate as distinctly as uh, the northern type. We have my time. Thirty. Okay. okay, so this is uh, NJ tree. Just to see the best and the distance. So you will see uh, same way of separation that you can see uh, in the previous slide with the PCA. Um, again, we, what we think so far is uh, these two uh, accessions, what you have here from boreal and the corybosum, so they can be a bridge accessions. So that's, uh, well, we haven't um, proved yet, but the, those can serve as a bridge accessions between these two species. And this is to talk about um, nucleotide diversity. So. We have plenty more uh, number of accessions in Darabai. Even with that, we but there is um, less nucleotide diversity uh, in uh, uh, Darabai compared to the 10 LM and Boreal. So when you look at the admixture, um, admixture, the first one to deviate from all the rest of the group, or whatever we have studying, is the uh, boreal. So boreal, boreal here, here you, the, when you have it made into two clusters, you have northern type and then southern type. And then you further divide, the uh, boreal got separated out immediately. The, not the, all the southern types stayed as it is. And then after when you make four, four clusters, then you have 10 LM uh, separated out. And then after you make five or six, uh, we don't we couldn't see the separation uh, between uh, mercinitis and darovite. So 
with, we are thinking they are admixture because of their habitat, because they grow under similar conditions. There may be cross pollination happen outcrossing between the two species, and it's hard to uh, um, separate out. And this is also very interesting uh, in the Manhattan plots. When you see the Manhattan plots, comparing with uh, uh, here, I'm particularly interested here with boreal, comparing with all other uh, species, you have a negative selection here. Um, where you, you have a positive selection here with uh, pairwise comparisons. And the FST also is higher in Mercenitis and Boreal compared to Mercenitis and Darwin. that what you see in this graph. So um, the admixture is high, so you also can see FST is uh, low between those two species. So we also looked at the migration events between the um, species that we studied. So Boreal just stood out immediately. And then as a big event happened, uh, the foreign bosom might have formed from the, uh, originated from the Boreal. And then you have smaller events from foreign bosom that, uh, to other species. So it, it may tell us that Boreal may be the progenitor for northern type blueberries or blue, uh, blueberries that we call them. And we also looked at the look for the selective sweeps. Are there any selective sweeps among, sweeps among the species? So in uh, chromosome 12, we can see a selective sweep. Uh, so we choose a corymbosome as a comparison because that is the cultivated one. The rest of them are wild species. So you can see a clear uh, selective sweep here. Um, probably whatever genes are there uh, in the chromosome 12 in this region are uh, making the natural selection or artificial selection uh, over other species. So that uh, sweep region is around uh, 715 uh, base, uh, kilo base weights, and it's 32 genes. Uh, that may be uh, interesting to look uh, for further deep, uh, further uh, uh, in deeply. Some of the genes that I found among 32 were uh, some medicine maintenance, DNA repair, sucrose repair genes. So there may be for interest for further studies in those. So this is to summarize what we have. Um, so Darwe and Mercenitis, that's why, because Boreal, in the, Boreal is in the uh, Canada with Rocky Mountains and so on. So uh, all, uh, higher altitude habitat, the Corymbosum is in uh, swamp areas in New Jersey. So there may be, uh, there is a, not much possibility for cross-contamination, cross-pollination uh, cross or crossing between these species, but sometimes we have a, um, uh, originated from the boreal. But whereas in the Darway and Mycenaites, because they're cohabited between the similar places, so there may be a lot of admixture happen in those two species. So that's uh, our uh, prediction from the study. I, my collaborators, uh, Nick Woods, I have been talking about, and uh, he provided um, the material and the knowledge about blueberries because I am very naive when I started this project and he helped me understand about blueberries and uh, sharing the, his knowledge and wisdom. And Dr. Umesh Reddy from West Virginia State and he was, he's our my um, bioinformatics guru. So if I need any analysis, so he's the one I go with him and he helped me a lot. And all, uh, some of the students are not there any now. The paper that published is from Byron. He's in Florida now. And uh, all of them are master students, graduated, and everybody is doing good. And, um, she's also a model now. <laughs> and uh, Heyman uh, Wen is here. And uh, Tommy joined later after uh, we took the picture, so I had to have her separately here. And this is my lab website, um, if you are, any of you are interested to explore. Um, I, we can stop here, and then um, I can open for questions. 
Um, at the beginning of your talk, you showed us some photographs of fruit uh, in response to heat stress. But I noticed that most of your phenotyping of heat stress was on leaf property. Yes. So I'm wondering, how have you found there's a good association between the effects on leaves and the effects on things like fruits, fat, uh, flowers, fat, and yield? Flowers, uh, I haven't started yet. That's uh, the future study. <laughs> yeah, no, we haven't started that. So we started with, because um, for me, easier, uh, yeah. Since we have F2, they bear flower different times. According to the experiment, will become harder. Uh, so we initiated with the leaves that is easier. You can measure all at one time and one ex one time exposure of the treatments. So in the future. So the heat stress um, experiment you did. Um, what was the humidity like? Was it very dry or was it very? I don't remember, but uh, it was 70 percent. Yeah. It was in the growth room that we import the temperature, so we can regulate. Is mercenides possibly an allopolyploid, and if so, does it perhaps have the genome of corymbosum as part of it? And that would explain the admixture that you see. To the Darwin, what do you mean? Dar sorry, Darwin. Yeah. Hello, polyploid. I'm not sure. Hello, polyploid. I'm not. I want to turn that angle. So only we thought maybe because uh, mercenitis has a tetraploid version also. Uh, tetraploid version. So because of the outcrossing nature, there may be uh, admixture happen. So don't know. Darawi also has the tetraploid versions. Tetraploid. Version. That is the one most the people utilized for uh, developing southern blueberries. Uh, Florida B two type for many. Um, this that is the one reason also I I got interested in this project, looking at the different species because whatever genome you know, the existing many of them not I'm not taking uh, blanketing all of them but many of the blueberry projects that we have the base uh, the genetic material is the same coming from similar or fewer sources. Um, so maybe if we Shining light on different species, we can use them the for some plants. For the tetraploid hairwise extension, does it have all also have the small leaves and typical the tetraploid one? So the shape is same, but a little bit bigger than bigger yeah. is plant it smaller also than smaller than carambosum. Plant can go up to my height, the tetraploid one. But uh, the diploids are thin plants. The shape is almost the same. Uh, yeah, that's hard. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. Yeah, the first one you mentioned is uh, one gene that's involved in uh, meristemic uh, maintenance. I, I, I wonder if the question is like, uh, is specific to the human or to shoes? This is uh, from the annotation. Uh -huh. um, so we have to find out more. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We thought that we experimentally proved. We looked at the, the sequences. With annotation, blast that. So, but the gene that's involved in the, uh, the maintenance of uh, uh, very strong maintenance very strong yeah. activity. Yes. Yeah, so this one, and the second one is like very interesting. Uh, the blueberry, uh, so we, we discussed a little bit uh, this morning, the fire, uh, acidic soil or something. My question is what's the role of low pH or aluminum and ALP plus? How, I mean, this. Contribute to uh, or maintenance the growth of blueberry or promote uh, the secondary uh, metabolites of flavor. I haven't looked at aluminum point or effect of aluminum point of view, uh -huh. but I had some bad experience when we have soil. So when we when I started this project, mm -hmm. we just used the greenhouse water, whatever water is available in the greenhouse. Plants are terrible. They look terrible, and they are not growing. Up. And then, um, because when you just just start your uh, faculty position, you have not rush, right? You wanted to, <laughs> and I have undergrad students working with me. And then I spent more time. How? What? Then we went to the test the soil pH. What the 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 water in the greenhouse? It was like five something, uh, five point two or five point one. 
Right plants are not, uh, uh, they're, they're sick, sick almost. So then we literally took uh, some HCL, HCL diluted, and then we mix with water, and then plant, um, then apply it to the blueberry pot. After a two, three weeks, you can see they are coming back again. So, so pH, is pH, yeah. So that I can tell with confidence. But with aluminum, I have, we haven't tried uh, any experiment with that. Definitely. That we can talk uh, for further. Yeah, sure, sure. I, can I can send samples and we can also. Yeah. Sure. yeah did you remember like, that we did one picture say with a different pH? Even if it is pH more than 6, it is. The plants are showing all uh, <clears throat> necrotic symptoms. Even if it is lesser than three, they are showing even even though they low acidic, but not uh, lower than three. Yeah. yeah, I think one summer project. For yeah, we did. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.